Hey everyone, welcome back. It's time for part two of my functions presentation. So let's go ahead and get started. In this, in this presentation, we'll cover local and global variables. We'll cover implementing a menu system using functions. We'll talk about uh, initializing parameters and uh, static variables. Okay, so I am <clears throat> in Microsoft Visual Studio Express 2013 and I'm going to create a new project. All right, empty project, and we'll call this functions two, part two. Okay. All right, so we'll create a new project. We'll add some source uh, source file. We'll call it main, and we'll get started. Okay, so we have to do a pound include here, uh, stream using namespace standard and int main. All right, so I think the first thing that I'll do is I think I'll show you the difference between a local and a global variable, right? So a local variable is any variable that is defined inside a function. Now int main itself is a function, so if I was to declare and initialize a variable x say inside main then x is local to the main function all right let me put in a pause here all right and int x is local to main that means that uh, only main can access x right now all right so i'll write a quick little do nothing function Remember, we talked about prototypes last time, so I'll go ahead and write another prototype. And this will be a void function, and it's not going to do anything. I'll we'll just call it foo. Okay, there's a parameter list. Uh, it has a zero parameter parameter list. It's a void function. It's not going to return anything. It's not going to accept anything. All it's going to do is print out a string. Okay, so down here, let's do the definition. Oops. I don't know why that does that, sorry. Okay. Okay, function definitions are down here. And we'll define our void foo function. Remember, functions definitions, they have a return type, they have a name, they have a parameter list, and all of those things combined to make up the function header. Alright, and in addition, a function has a body which is all the statements that are executed when the function is called. Okay, so in foo, I'm going to make a local variable, right? And I'll call it int y. Okay, so now y is local to foo. That means that y is only accessible. I can only use y inside this foo function. All right, so let me do a quick little see out. y. Okay, and then I'll make a quick little function call. And we'll call fill. All right. So let's run this thing. What it's going to do is it's just going to show us, uh, it's just going to execute foo, and it's just going to do a C out showing us zero basically. All right, so let's compile it and run it. All right, and so there we go. All right, so now since y is local to foo, um, it can only be manipulated within foo. I can't go into main and then do something with it, right? Try to change it or assign a new value to it, right? If I try to do that, you'll notice this red squiggly underscore here, and it says that uh, y is undefined. That's because y is local only to the foo function, right? And similarly, if I tried to do something with x in here, right, I'm going to get the same thing. Right, that's because x is only local to the main function. Okay, if I try to compile this, I'm going to get an error. It's not going to work. All right. So let's go ahead and take these these assignment statements out since they are causing us a compile time error. Now um, that explains what local variables are. But we also have an additional local variables. We also have what's called global variables. Okay, and global variables are variables that are defined outside of 
all functions. Okay, so if I wanted a global variable, global variables, I could uh, define it outside all the functions, and I could do it here. So if I was to say int z equals 10, for example, okay. Now suddenly, z, since it's defined outside all of the functions, it's defined outside of main, and it's defined outside of foo. Now both main and foo can now access this global z variable, all right? They can assign new values to it, they can print, they can do whatever they want to do with it. All right, so in my main, I'll go ahead and assign z a variable or a value say one right. and then inside foo i will display it okay. see out z equals z all right so main's going to assign one to this global variable z and then foo's going to print it out all right so let's go ahead and run that and make sure it works and so there we go, z equals one, all right? So z is a global variable, all right? It's accessible to both main and foo. Global variables are defined outside of all functions that you write, okay? X is local to main and y is local to foo, all right? So global variables are generally a bad idea. They make debugging programs more complicated, more difficult. Say something went wrong and one of these functions, say I had like 20 functions and all of them had access to this global variable Z. And let's say that one of the functions had a bug in it that caused Z to be assigned the wrong value. Well, if Z is global, then I'm not sure which function uh, caused the problem, caused Z to be assigned the wrong value. So that's why global variables are kind of a bad idea, right? So try to avoid using them if you can, but if you can't, if you, for some reason, you absolutely positively have to have a global variable, make it a const, okay? Make it a constant. So now when it's a constant, I can't modify this variable in any way. I can still use it, but I can't modify it. See the red regular line here? If I try to compile this thing, I get a build error, and that's because you can't assign a value to a constant, all right? So let's go ahead and get this out of here, all right? And we will compile it now. It'll, everything will work just fine, all right? But what's gonna happen is, is that C out, the C out statement inside foo is gonna print out the contents of Z, but that's fine, okay? Because uh, Z is not gonna change, all right? Okay, so that's the difference between local and global variables. All right, so the next thing we need to talk about, uh, I think we'll talk about static variables. Okay, so normally when you have a local variable and it, uh, when you have a local variable inside a function and that function finishes executing, that variable dies. All right? That means, that is to say that whatever variable you have inside a function, say inside foo, for example, this y variable, as soon as foo finishes executing, y disappears, it goes away, it no longer exists, all right? But we can get around that by using what's known as a static variable. Okay, so let me modify this foo function really quick. It's still going to uh, display y, okay? But we're gonna make the y value static, the y variable, excuse me, static, okay? And when we do this, uh, the y variable will it's life, it's gonna continue living between calls to foo, right? So, <clears throat> if I was to initialize this thing to zero and then say increment, or say print it out and then increment y by one, all right? We'll see what happens here. Uh, the first time I call it, it's going to display zero as it should, okay? And there we go. Now, if I was to call it again, oops. if I was to call it again, then the foo value 
is going to be the y inside foo is going to be incremented, right? This y plus plus increments it. And this value is going to be sticky. That is to say that it's going to be incremented to 1, and it's going to stay around in between calls to foo. All right, so let's run this thing. You'll see now the second time I call it, it's 1. All right, that's because the first time I called it, it ended up incrementing y to 1, and the second time I called it, uh, that value was still alive, right? It was still in memory somewhere, right? If I call foo again, it gets incremented again, right? So with static variables, uh, the value sticks, sticks around, okay? And whatever you initialize it to, okay, it's going to be, that's going to be the value the first time you call it. But subsequent calls uh, are going to change whatever values stored inside the static variable. Okay, it's only get initial. It only gets initialized one time. All right. So static variables can be useful. Say you want to ensure that, say that y was an ID, right? and say, uh, say foo was a function that uh, created a record of some kind. We wanted to make sure that our records uh, had unique IDs. Well, static variables are one way we can go about doing that. All right. Okay. So the next thing we can talk about is initializing parameters or default parameters. All right. So <clears throat> let's say that I have this new function. Uh, we'll call it bar. And I'll give it a parameter list, a few parameters here, int, 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 all right? So that's how we would normally create a prototype. But let's say that I wanted to have some default value for these parameters. Say that um, I wanted to give the programmer the option of when they call this function of having certain values already passed to the function, okay, or already assigned to these parameters. Well, I can assign, I can do a, uh, I can initialize these things with a default value. And so how I do that is I just assign, I just use the assignment operator and I give it whatever default value that I want. So let's say that I have this function uh, bar and I wanted all of the default parameters to be zero. So by default, without passing any arguments to it, I just want to have the parameters assigned the value zero. This is how I do it. Okay, so now I have a parameter list. And let me just make some function definition here for bar, and it's not gonna do anything. All I'll do is print out whatever I pass to it. Uh, void bar int x equals zero, int y equals zero, int z equals zero. Okay, and what this will do is it'll just display whatever is in this parameter, okay? So x equals x, uh, y equals y, and z equals z, right? We'll do it in there right here. Okay, so now I can call bar. I have some options on how I want to call this thing. Right? If I just call bar without passing any arguments at all, then uh, zero is going to be automatically assigned to each one of these parameters. Okay, so let's run this thing and see how it goes. Oops, what did I do wrong? Alright, hold on. Okay. Uh, oh, sorry, I forgot that uh, in the parameter list for the definition, we don't we don't also assign it, right? It's only in the prototypes where we do this. Sorry about that, I my bad, I didn't confuse you too much, okay. So we do this initialization inside the parameter list for the prototype, okay? Not in the parameter list uh, for the uh, function definition itself. Okay, so let's run this thing and see what happens now, now that I fixed that. Okay, you can see that even though I haven't passed any values to my bar function, uh, x is equal to zero, y is equal to zero, and z is equal to zero. Okay. Um, now, I can call bar in different ways. Notice that x, y, and z have zero assigned to them, 
Um, but I didn't pass any, actually pass any arguments to bar. Okay, but if I want to, I'm still free to pass whatever values I want to to bar. So let's say I wanted to display one, two, and three. I can still do this. Okay, this will work just fine. All right, and there we go. All right, so I have options. Okay, these are the same function definitions. It's just if there are no arguments passed to bar, then it's going to use whatever this default is, equals zero uh, for each one of the parameters in this case. I can assign whatever integer I want to these uh, parameters. It's just that for my example, I wanted to set them all to zero. Okay, so there's a couple other options we can do, or a couple other ways we can do this. Uh, we can also only have some of the parameters initialized to some value. All right, so so I can uh, decide that I only want to have, say, the last two variables uh, uh, initialized to something. Okay, that's fine. That will work. Okay, but if I do that, then you notice how this has a uh, squiggly red squiggly line here. This is indicating that this syntax is no longer correct. This means that I have to provide at least some value for this first argument since it doesn't have uh, a default value. Okay, so now I could just do something like this. Right? If I do that, then one is copied into this first parameter and zero is assigned to the other two. That's fine. Um, I could also do something like this. Okay, and in this case, one is copied to the first parameter and two is copied to the second parameter, right? It's not using this default anymore because I've actually assigned something to it. Two is gonna be copied into the second parameter, right? But the third parameter still has a default value and that is zero. So zero will be uh, copied into, or zero will be what's displayed. So let me go ahead and run this and just show you what that's gonna look like. And uh, there we go, right? So, um, <clears throat> So this bar corresponds to this line here, all right? This bar call uh, corresponds to this line here, all right? And the third, the third call corresponds to this line here, all right? And so just like uh, everything else with parameters, orders matters, okay? So we have to make sure that we assign our arguments in the correct order. Right. We can't do something like this, for example. We couldn't do something like like this. Okay, and assume that the second uh, parameter is going to be initialized to zero. See this quick line? That's uh, that's invalid syntax. All right. We have to make sure that whatever arguments we pass match this thing up here. Okay. So in this particular case, we have to provide at least one argument. That's the first argument here. Okay, and when we're designating our parameter list, okay, we also can't, uh, the order matters here too, okay, so we can't do something like this. This is a syntax error as well, all right? So the, uh, if you're going to have multiple parameters, you're going to have uh, default values for all of them, uh, it's got to be all three, okay? You can't do one on, on the ends and then skip one in the middle, all right? But you can do something like this, okay? So basically, if you're going to have any parameters that don't have default values, they have to be at the front of the parameter list, okay? Um, you can't have a parameter at the beginning have a default value and then any of the following parameters not have a default. So that doesn't work either. Okay. So if the first if the first parameter has a default value, then the rest of them have to have a default value. All right. So you can skip you can skip the first parameter in the list, and that's fine. Um, but then any any parameters that have a default value in your parameter list, all of the parameters after them have to have a default value as well. Okay. All right. So that covers what I want to talk about with uh, default values for parameters. Okay. All right. So we've talked about 
local and global variables. We've talked about initializing parameters, and we've talked about static variables. So the last thing we can talk about is uh, implementing a menuing system using functions. And this is going to be how you can go about doing the quarter project. Now, in an earlier chapter, we talked about the switch statement. And the switch statement is perfect for implementing a menu. And so what I will do, I'll just, I think I'll just explain this by doing an example. All right, I'll use a do while loop to implement a menu system. And it's going to display a menu. And then based on the user's choices, it's either going to uh, run foo or run bar. Okay. So let's add a do while loop here. And remember, do while loops are post test loops. They are going to run at least once. So they'll run uh, one or more times. Okay. Oops. Do while uh, choice does not equal Q. And choice does not equal lowercase q. Okay. Actually, this should be or, because either one of these. So basically, with, with this expression here, uh, if the user enters a choice of q or q, uh, uppercase q or lowercase q, then we'll break out of this do, lip, this do loop, excuse me, and uh, we'll no longer be executing our program. Right? I don't need a pause here because the do while loop is going to continue executing until I hit Q. And when I hit Q, uh, then the program's going to close. And that's fine because the user selected Q. They want to quit. We don't have to pause it on top of everything else. All right, so let me get rid of this here. We don't need that for my example. Uh, I think Z I'll leave in here because this calls it, so that's fine. Oh, actually, it's going to use it. Bar is using it as its own local parameter here. Okay, so I'm going to get rid of this global variable too. All right, just to clean things up. Bit. Okay, so <clears throat> we're going to have this variable called choice, right? And that's what we're going to use to store the selection from the user. All right, so the first thing we need to do is we need to print out some kind of a menu. And we'll have them select B for bar and uh, F for foo. And then uh, we'll have a prompt that says enter your selection. All right. Then we will read the selection into choice. And that's great. Okay, you know what, I'll actually split these up on two separate lines because this may be a little confusing otherwise. Let's get a little more clear. Alright, why are you giving me that squiggly line there? Visual Studio Express being lame, okay? There was nothing wrong, it just was indicating it anyway. All right, all right, so this is going to print out uh, a few lines that say B for bar, uh, F for foo, and your selection. We'll get the selection for the user. And then based on that, we can uh, select what which function we're gonna use, or we're gonna execute. Okay, so we'll use a switch statement to do that. Switch choice, okay. And we'll have a few cases. All right, or a couple. Of, we'll have a few cases, and we'll start off by writing the first case, which is B. Right. Case B. Don't invent that for me. I like it this way. Okay. Uh, so bar is going to accept uh, multiple values, but uh, for this example, I'll uh, only ask the user for the x value. Okay. So. <clears throat> Let me uh, x value. Let me do this. Right. Okay, so 
If they choose B for bar, then we're going to run this, this function bar, but bar needs some arguments. So I'll ask them for the first one. Okay. So C out, enter, and X value. All right. Then we'll use C in to grab it. Okay. And then we will call our bar function. Bar, we're going to pass it the X value. And that's all I'm going to pass it. Because right, I have these two default parameters, so that's fine. That's, I'm just going to pass it uh, one argument, and then whatever the user enters is going to be copied into this first parameter, and then the other two are going to be zero by default. Okay. All right. Let's have a break statement here. And uh, that, covers, that covers the first selection. Right. So the other option we have, uh, they, the user could choose F for foo. So let's do a case for foo, all right? Um, foo, all it does is print out this ID value, um, so we don't have to pass it anything, so we don't have to ask the user for any in additional information, but I'll, I'll do a C out statement here just to let them know that foo is running. Okay, running foo. Okay, and then um, we'll call foo. And then we'll break because we're done with it. Don't I want that and we'll make it that way. Okay. All right. So there we go. We have two choices. So now the last choice we have is uh, what happens if the user hits Q. Okay. So I'll put in uh, case Q. And it's going to do nothing. Okay. We don't want, there's no additional code we want to execute. So we'll just break. We'll break right out of the switch statement. Okay. Uh, and similarly for Q, we don't want to execute any additional code. So we will add uppercase Q. Stop auto indenting. Stop auto indenting. I don't want you to do that. Okay. All right. So because of the fall through logic, if they select lowercase Q, it'll fall through until it hits this break and bust out. If they hit an uppercase Q, it'll come down here and then it'll just fall through and hit the break and be done. Right? And as soon as um, it's finished executing the, or as soon as uh, those Qs are entered, it's gonna get down to the bottom here. And since either uppercase Q or lowercase Q is entered, then that'll break us out of our do while loop and then we'll exit the program. Okay. So this is a way by using this fall through logic that we can accept both upper and lowercase selections uh, for our menu. All right, so I'll also add uppercase here as well, using the same uh, logic. All right. So now I'm accepting either uppercase or lowercase for any of my selections. All right, so let's. Uh, Let's give this thing a, uh, a test. Let's see what happens. All right, so there's my menu, as I talked about. I want to select, say, B, B for bar. All right, it asks me for, to enter next value, and I'll say 10. And uh, bar does what it's supposed to do. It just displays what X is equal to, and what Y is equal to, and what Z is equal to. All right, now I will test my foo function, okay, and it shows what the ID number is. That's all it's supposed to do. All right. Um, but now I'll, I'll enter in uh, uppercase B for bar. We'll see that that works. All right. And I'll enter 12 this time for X. Okay. There we go. X equals 12. Y equals 0. Z equals 0. And I'll, I'll uh, enter uppercase F. And boo runs as well. And remember, the ID variable was static. So it's getting incremented each time. And it's staying around. The uh, static ID variable continues living in between function calls. All right. So now, if I want to quit this program, I can just hit uh, Q, a lowercase Q, or an uppercase Q. All right. Or not. What did I do? Hold on a second here. Oh, found my bug. The uh, my logical operator is incorrect. It should be and, not or. Okay. Because if it's if it's uh, if it's or, then um, 
one of these will evaluate to true, but the other one will evaluate to false. One of them will evaluate to false, the other one will evaluate to true, so this thing will keep going. Remember, because uh, the expression with the logical or is, if either one of them is true, then uh, the whole thing's true, and it'll keep, it'll keep going along, and it'll keep repeating the loop. So let's get out of here. I'm going to control C to do that. Break out. Okay, and we'll push stop there. So all we have to do is change this here. Sorry about that little brain fart. Okay, so let's do it again. Okay, so now if I hit Q, I'm done. Mm -hmm. So see, even professors can make mistakes. All right, and if I hit lowercase Q, I'm done. Okay, um, but what happens if I hit some value that isn't in my switch statement? Let's say that I hit H, all right? It uh, just keeps looping through. That's fine. Oops, B was B's fine. B's a valid, valid uh, option. I hit Z, whatever. Um, it just gives the user this menu again. Uh, it doesn't really tell them what's going on. You know, that might be confusing. So why don't we add a default case here? All right. And default is the portion of the switch statement. This is code that is going to be executed. Uh, if there are no matches for any of the cases. So I'll just put a little note here, invalid option. Try again. All right, and that's all I'm gonna do. All right, so now if I run this thing, if I enter an invalid option, say uppercase C, right, it gives the user a little bit more information. Invalid option, try again. Okay, and then I'll quit. All right, um, but maybe I want to say goodbye. I'll decide to say goodbye here. All right. Now let's try this thing again. So I do my foo. All foo does is it shows the value for the ID. All right, and I can keep doing this. And since it's static, it continues to implement. Now if I hit Q, uh, it's going to say goodbye, but I need to put a pause in there if I want you to be able to see it through. Pause. All right, so we'll put the pause in here. All right, now let's try it. All right, so if I hit Q, it says goodbye. It pauses. Your user can read. It says goodbye, and it's done. All right, so let's say that uh, I wanted to add another function to this thing. Let's say that uh, you know this is version 1.0, but uh, version 2.0 is going to have uh, another function. Let's say it's going to add the ability to add two numbers. All right. So all I have to do is write my function, all right, add a plug a case into the switch statement, and we're good to go. Okay, a case that uh, executes the newly added function. So let's add an add function. Oops. Add int int. All right. There's a prototype for it. Now let's define it. Excuse me, let's define it. Int add int uh, a and int b. Okay. And all this is going to do is return this um, return a plus b. All right? Bam. Now all I have to do is add a case in here. Okay, so we will add case plus. Okay. And <clears throat> We will have to have a couple variables to store whatever the user chooses. And we'll say um, b1 for value 1 and b2 for value 2. All right. Okay. So then we have to ask the user uh, out, enter two numbers to add. Something silly. All right. And then we can have a scene statement that combines the two. C in B1, B2, and then we'll have a CF statement. The sum of B1 and B2 equals, uh, what was it, add B1, B2. Stream insertion software, excuse me. All right, so there, I've just, I wrote a new function. I plugged it into my program. 
and uh, I'm ready to go. So let's run this thing. Oh, you know what I forgot to do? I should add into my menu that option. I forgot that. Gotta let the user know that it's there. Alright. Alright, so now see we have our new option to our menu. And if I select plus, okay, and there are two numbers to add, I want to add five and three. Okay, so five and three equals eight. Oh, did I forget? I forgot to break it. I said it. Oops. So let's put that in there. Okay. Alright. Alright, so let's test it again. Uh, let's time we'll add three and two. Okay, there we go. Sum of three and two equals five. Right? And if I want to run my foo function, I can still do that. If I want to run my bar function, I can still do that. Wait, what? I'm kind of in here. Hold on. Another bug. Stupid bugs. Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, you know what it is, is that uh, there is a carriage return still in the keyboard buffer, so we need to deal with that. Alright, we'll put you there, and that should take care of that. Alright, so plus, three, two. Now if I want to run foo, there we go. Okay, test bar. Uh, bar works just great. Okay, so um, we developed a quick program here. Let's quit. Goodbye. Um, and we wrote a few functions. I uh, implemented an ugly menuing system, very dirty. Right, this isn't very clean, but it works. All right, for the purposes of our example. Um, then after I finished version 1.0 and version 2.0, I added this add function, right? I added my prototype and I wrote the uh, add function. So as soon as I was finished with that, all I had to do was go back inside here and plug in the case that executes it, right? So this is how we can write a program, right? Uh, and develop it as we go. We can add functionality to it. So for the quarter project, you can follow this exact same, uh, a very similar procedure. All right, so you can start with a basic menuing system, right, and then you can plug in each function as you write them, as you learn how to write them, uh, as you go. So hopefully it won't be too difficult for you to go about this thing, okay? So first thing you'll want to do is you'll want to uh, write your menuing system, and then just develop each function one at a time and plug it in as you go. So you should be able to get started on that right now. Okay, you know how to use a switch statement. You know how to write basic functions. We haven't gotten to, we haven't covered arrays yet, but once we've covered arrays and you learn how to work with arrays, then you can plug in the functions that deal with those. All right, so uh, hopefully you'll have some fun with that. And this concludes our coverage of functions and hopefully you'll be ready to go for the exam. All right, great. Thanks for watching and we'll see you on test day. Have a have a good night.